everybody, thanks for joining us again. I'm really excited for the next talk that we have. Um, up next is Amy Stepanovich. She's the executive director at Silicon Flatirons. Um, she's a nationally recognized expert in domestic surveillance, cybersecurity, and privacy law. In the past, she served as US policy manager and global policy counsel for Access Now. And prior to that, she was the director of the domestic surveillance project at Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, so as you can tell, she has a really long, amazing resume. Um, anyways, we're really looking forward to her talk this year. This is the second year she's talked at B-Sides, um, and last year was fantastic. Um, this year, her talk is a victory lap to the end of the world about government hacking. So Amy, please uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Will. What a wonderful introduction. That was way too kind. Um, I am going to pull up some slides, hopefully the right tab. Yes, I got it right the first time. Um, so thank you all for having me and letting me talk and present to you all on um, government hacking and more specifically um, the recent um, incident around the Microsoft um, Exchange server. Um, this is me. I, as Will said, I'm the executive director for the Silicon Flatiron Center. I worked previously at Epic and at Access Now. Um, and a few years ago, I authored a report called The Human Rights Response to Government Hacking, where I was, um, I felt really lucky that my employer gave me an opportunity to spend some time deep diving into the history of government hacking, not only in the US, but all over the world, and looking at um, what had happened previously what we knew about it, what we didn't know about it, um, and comparing it to human rights standards and how the operations had met or more often than not, not met human rights standards. And what we ended up doing is setting out a framework with 10 different um, principles that we thought should govern um, government hacking operations. It was a pretty stringent um, set of principles, admittedly, um, but really, government surveillance tends to um, fall, I think, um, quite frequently as somebody who does human rights on the side of not respecting human rights um, way too often. So we wanted to provide that other side um, of things. And I think throughout my talk, you'll, you'll start to understand why. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I, I kind of want to go backward in time a little bit and um, to start at the beginning of, of the conversation around um, enhanced, what I'll call enhanced government surveillance in the US um, and talk about how we got here. So the conversation today is going to start around 1928. Um, government hacking clearly wasn't in the conversation around 1928, but they were talking about wiretapping. Um, and the conversation revolved around um, a, um, a person named Olmsted, he was he was a rum runner. He he brought alcohol in from Canada into the United States um, and was had been wiretapped um, and is a, it was a very well known case. And essentially the Supreme Court found that the, the Fourth Amendment did not apply in his case. Um, uh, it was a fairly controversial decision and the justices of the Supreme Court, um, along with many, many people after this case was decided, um, I don't think it sat well that um, this new wiretapping technology wasn't going to be protected um, under the Fourth Amendment. Um, as you'll see here, I have a quote, um, as a means of espionage, Writs of assistance and general warrants are but puny instruments of tyranny and oppression when compared with wiretapping. Um, this is a quote from Justice Brandeis. Um, general warrants are the reason the Fourth Amendment was written um, into the Constitution to begin with. So when you think that calling a general warrant insignificant when compared to the dangers of wiretapping, that's a, a pretty grand statement. Um, and as a result, um, largely of this case, we get our very first wiretapping laws in the U.S. Um, in 1934, the predecessor to what is today known um, as the Wiretap Act, um, although that came later. Um, and it wasn't until 1967 that we had a case known as CATS um, that really overturned or maybe complemented Olmstead. Um, 
weird legal questions um, that have come up since. Um, but we get the fact that the Fourth Amendment attaches to people, not places, and this reasonable expectation of privacy test. Um, but the wiretap act remains. And this idea that new technologies require new enhanced protections still apply. And the wiretap act actually goes way beyond um, the protections in the Fourth Amendment and requires more than the Fourth Amendment requires. So we're going to jump in time again, this time up to 1999, um, where we have what we know of as the first US government hacking operation. Um, it was a, targeted at Nicodemo Scarfo, who was a mob boss out of Philadelphia. Um, and the key, it was a key logger that was installed manually on his computer in order to get a password. Essentially, he was using um, end-to-end -end encrypted email, um, PGP, and they needed to get the password in order to um, be able to, to know what, um, what he was sending back and forth. Really um, important theme coming from government hacking operations right out the door around transparency, even though we were able to, the public was able to find out that this was a hacking operation, that a keylogger was involved. The fact that it was manually installed, the details around that were withheld for quite some time. And a lot of journalists um, and public information, um, open government um, advocates had to do a lot of digging in order to get the details out around this case, which is going to become um, a recurrent theme Throughout government hacking operations, the government never volunteers great, um, great amounts of information about what they're doing in these cases. People really do a lot of digging in order to find out what's going on. Um, so we'll call this Generation 1, um, which leads to, of course, Generation 2, the rise of the government hacking machines, we, we, can, we can say. Um, we'll get tools like Magic Lantern and CPAV um, you know, technology um, folks and lawyers both love acronyms. And so there's a confluence here of just an abundance of acronyms. Um, Computer and Internet Protocol Address Verifier. These are remotely re installed tools um, that also communicate remotely and are used to collect um, varying amounts of information depending on the operation at issue. Once again, we have um, a number of journalists to thank for the information that is publicly available um, about these tools and about the operations on which they are used. Um, in particular, a bunch of journalists at Wired Magazine. Um, and I want to offer my personal thanks to the folks at Wired. Um, they've done some great reporting on US government hacking operations and on these tools. And if you're really interested about the history here, um, I suggest that you look up Wired's reporting um, because it's it's pretty stellar. One case in particular that I, I have found really um, educational on this specific generation of hacking operations is in Ray warrant to search a target computer. Um, case name really rolls off the tongue, right? You're, you're really going to remember that. I know um, essentially it was a case out of um, the Southern District of Texas in 2013, Judge Stephen Smith. Um, there were a few holdings, but two of them really specifically stand out. And we're going to come back to these holdings a few times as I continue through um, the talk. The first one is that the warrant application um, in this case, the government's um, request to conduct the, the search, the hacking operation, did not satisfy the territorial limits of the rule governing um, the authority of the magistrate to issue the warrant. Um, Judge Stephen Smith said, I have limits on my ability to issue a warrant in this case um, under the rules of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And this application does not satisfy um, those limits. Keep that in mind. Um, spoilers, you're going to be hearing about this rule in great depth in just a couple slides. Um, it, he also said that the application did not satisfy the Fourth Amendment's particularity requirement. So if I go back just real quick um, to the text of the Fourth Amendment, what you'll see is right here at the end that it needs to particularly 
um, describe the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Those are the last few words there in the text of the Fourth Amendment. Um, if you are not saying what computer or who the person is that you're going to conduct the operation against, as many of these hacking operations do not, um, Judge Smith was essentially saying you're not meeting the standards that the Fourth Amendment sets out. Which brings us, and as I said, hold on to those two holdings. Don't let go, we're coming back to them. Um, but brings us to kind of our third generation, um, third type of hacking cases as we move forward into 2014, um, which is the Playpen case. Um, so in 2014, the FBI gets a tip about Playpen, which is a Tor hidden service um, on which child um, exploitative material is being um, hosted, shared, distributed. Um, they get a search warrant to seize the website, but instead of taking the website down, as you would think they would do, they actually start to take over hosting the website. And in fact, reports say that um, while the FBI was hosting the website, that the uh, quality of the website actually went up, that they were hosting it better than the people who were originally hosting um, Playpen were doing it. They applied for a second warrant to send malware to visitors of the site, um, exploiting what we think is a vulnerability in the Firefox browser code. Um, and as estimates, the best estimate I was able to find is that this led um, to at least 137 separate cases. Um, so because of this operation, they went after 137 different individuals um, and in those cases all over the country, um, potentially all over the world, um, there were a lot of different holdings that were coming down. And in fact, Professor Oren Kerr, who spends a lot of time thinking about these issues, um, has posited that this is the first case that one single warrant has led to circuit splits where um, entire circuits have taken different holdings um, stemming from the same warrant. So as I said, we're gonna come back to this rule um, that Judge Smith had pointed to. The rule is rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, and it governs when a magistrate judge can issue a warrant. And generally speaking, it says a lot of things about um, when a warrant can be issued. Um, but as a general rule, essentially a warrant should authorize a search that occurs within the jurisdiction of the judge who is issuing the warrant. And there are exceptions. So for example, um, if a judge issues a warrant to track a car and the car, which is a mobile object, moves outside of that jurisdiction, um, a new warrant doesn't have to issue in order to continue to track that car. Um, and that's baked into the rule itself. Um, but Judge Smith said, I can't, the search doesn't occur when you send out the malware. It occurs on the computer itself. And so unless you know the location of the computer, I'm not able to issue this warrant. And courts in the Playpen case started thinking about this as well. And they started saying that we also have to say that these, this warrant wasn't validly issued. Um, it didn't meet the requirements of Rule 41 because you didn't issue the warrant in the location where these computers were located. And therefore, it doesn't meet this um, jurisdictional requirement that Rule 41 has um, limiting where you can, um, where the judge could have issued this warrant from. And this was triggering the exclusionary rule, which basically said that if a warrant is invalid, the evidence from that warrant should be excluded. Um, as I said, these cases were all over the map. Um, judges were handing down all sorts of different verdicts um, as evidence and as these warrants were getting, this warrant, singular warrant, was getting challenged. Um, and some of the cases were saying, Rule 41 made this warrant invalid. Um, and so cases were starting to get thrown out because of it. And this worried the FBI, Department of Justice, um, for clear reasons. And decisions were made that they were going to start to pursue amendments to Rule 41 to allow um, 
this type of operation to happen um, in the future. So the amendment that they were pursuing essentially allowed um, for two different new exceptions to that jurisdictional requirement. The first was if the location of the computer was being uh, that they were trying to search was being concealed using technical means and the effects um, from the computer were being felt in the jurisdiction, um, then the judge could issue a warrant from anywhere. Um, the second was if damaged computers were located in five or more districts, then um, a judge could issue a warrant from anywhere. And this was a very contentious rule change. Um, they also changed the notice requirements for people impacted and advocates, experts, technical um, technologists all came out and said, this is a bad idea. You shouldn't put this rule change into effect. They had a lot of arguments against it, the least um, of which is you are taking away a procedural limitation without considering whether or not we need substantive rules. So whether or not this type of operation should be happening really is a question for Congress. Um, but Congress hasn't had a chance to speak to that. Um, but instead, what you're doing is wiping away this procedural safeguard that is in place um, without going through Congress, who typically would be needed to authorize this type of activity, um, kind of seen as an end run. Most of the debate, most of the discussion focused on this first prong. Um, location being concealed using technical means, effects being felt within the jurisdiction. Very little discussion actually focused on prong two, which becomes really relevant when we start talking about the Microsoft Exchange case, which we're going to be getting to um, very shortly. But I want to make sure you had this background on government opera um, hacking operations more broadly and on Rule 41 very specifically. Um, and why the exchange case, um, which will tell you why the exchange case is so incredibly important. Um, regardless of all of this opposition, the rule change ended up going into effect um, largely without any changes whatsoever, even though a very narrow suggestion was made that um, if location was being concealed, then maybe the operation should only try to uncover the location and not go any further to reveal any other information about the computer. That change was also rejected. Um, the change went into effect um, as it was proposed in tw late 2016, obliterated all these procedural hurdles um, that Judge Smith had spoken to, did leave in place the constitutional hurdle, and we'll talk about that as we um, end up, as I wrap up the conversation. Um, there was one last effort. Um, the SMH Act, um, very uh, purposefully titled the SMH Act, it was Stop Mass Hacking, um, but meant to allude to Shaking My Head, the popular internet meme. Um, Congress was not, did not have to give a blessing to this procedural change, but they did have a role where they could veto the rule change, essentially. And so Senator Wyden, um, with some partners in Congress, introduced legislation to veto the rule change. Unfortunately, it didn't get enough um, members of Congress in its corner to actually pass. And so the rule change still went into effect, regardless of this one last um, effort um, to try to stop it from taking place. So then where are we? We were in a place where we had some procedural limitations on hacking. We had some constitutional safeguards. All the procedural stuff we think got wiped out. Where does that leave us? Well, let's stop and talk about this Microsoft case. Um, remember, I opened, I am a, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a technologist. So I'm not going to go into great technical detail about the exchange case. Um, I am happy to refer you to people who can walk you through that, but I will give you an overview. We're going to call it the dummy's guide to the Hafnium case. 
Um, and I encourage you to either reach out to me and ask if you're looking for more information, or um, I can send you some information to um, different materials online if you're looking to just do research and, and read more about it. So Hebnium is basically state-sponsored actors traced back to China. Um, they used four zero-day vulnerabilities to compromise Microsoft Exchange servers. Um, once compromised, they installed shells to allow for further exploitation, both of the servers and the downstream computers. Um, following several reports that um, both the original Hafnium actors as well as other actors um, were using the vulnerabilities to compromise the servers, um, Microsoft started to issue patches. Um, the FBI actually got involved. CISA. Um, this, oh my goodness, I'm so looped up in the acronym of CISA, I can't even tell you immediately. Um, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Agency um, and government issued an official um, briefing about this um, because it was seen as being so critical. So all of these different government agencies got involved. Microsoft saw it as a critical um, situation that required immediate action. They issued patches um, and sent out information to clean up the shells. But estimates were saying that there were still, regardless of all of these different actions that have been taken, a large number of shells that were remaining on different computers. Um, and because of that, the FBI decided that they needed to step in. And so they sought um, and received a warrant to search the servers, copy um, in Fourth Amendment parlance, seize certain shells, and then delete them from the servers. So they went further than just to um, copy them for evidentiary purposes. They deleted them fully off of these computers. I want to identify a few things that they did that went a little bit beyond what they were required to do um, by law. Um, in the warrant application, they identified exactly which um, servers they were going to search. Um, they looked up who is data. They based the application um, specifically on the difficulty of removing the web shells. They referenced that they had passwords um, for the execution of the operation. They tested the code in advance internally and with external experts um, to limit the impact on other files. Um, they requested delayed notice. If you remember back, I said the Rule 41 amendments changed how notice had to happen. Um, but they actually engaged in some early notice um, in addition to the request for them to delay notice so that they could try to do extra outreach to folks who might be impacted in advance, even though they didn't have to. Um, that notice was eventually pursued through both direct messages, publication, and going through um, internet service providers. And eventually they published and they let the public know what they had done and what was the public response. It was overwhelmingly incredibly positive. Um, I published, I put on this slide a few of the um, stories that were published. The FBI might have fixed your Microsoft email server, said NBC, um, work to remediate the compromises continues. Um, you see, just Security says, were the government's actions helpful based on the information available now? The answer is yes. Just Security is generally seen to be pretty um, left-leaning. Um, here's a story that says, I believe this involvement by the FBI is seen as appreciated from the private sector when it comes to protecting against, against nation state attacks. Um, it's a wise move. This is very positive um, responses, both from um, government and technical experts, the private sector, um, people in the media. And these are just a few of the examples. Um, really, if you, and if you are on social media during this time, overwhelmingly, it was just a positive response that we got. Um, everybody thought that what the FBI had done in this case, because of the severity of this case in particular and the potential for um, really negative impacts, that this was something that they should have done and they did a good job doing it. Um, and because this specific case 
um, was receiving praise. Going backward, people started to say these Rule 41 changes that everybody like was really critical about, those were a really good idea. We're really glad that we did those. Um, and all of a sudden, everything that had happened leading up to this all of a seemed like a really great idea, and the FBI got a lot of pats on the back, which is how we get to this talk and the title of my talk about it being a victory lap and all of these good things that had happened and why I think we should take that victory lap, but also why I think the victory lap is probably ultimately leading us to a pretty bad place. Um, now, I do want to note before the before this case, before the Microsoft Exchange incident, we really don't have much indication of the use of these new powers in Rule 41. Now, remember I said it is a theme in Microsoft hacking operations that there's very little transparency about what is happening. And it's up to journalists and open government advocates to track things down. It's really hard to figure out what's going on and where it's going on. And so while we have not much indication that they have been used, it doesn't necessarily mean they haven't been used, um, but it doesn't mean they have. Is this the first? Maybe. Um, it will not be the last, though. Um, these new authorities, especially now that um, this positive reaction has come because of this case, um, it's going to be seen as a blessing for future operations not only in the US, but countries around the world are going to be <clears throat> and have already been standing up and taking notice. Um, we're not directly working with the US in partner operations. We know the UK, Australia, several countries often, often partner with the US, um, particularly on operations like government hacking operations. Um, they will presume that this is a green light to presume government hacking operations. And they're not going to look to any safeguards that the US put into place before they do so. They're not going to try to emulate um, what the US did in this instant, instance, um, just that they did this hacking stuff, um, went into private servers, did some things, and now it's OK for them to do it as well. This is, generally speaking, what happens um, when other countries look to the US as an example, unfortunately. Um, in the meantime, hacking operations are full steam ahead. We still have no substantive law on government hacking in the US. I talked about right at the beginning how we ended up with the Wiretap Act or the Wiretap Act's predecessor, really, because wiretapping was seen as such a significant deviation, so much more intrusive than previous means of conducting searches. Do you really think that hacking um, is not as significantly different um, from what we have done up until now in conducting searches and wiretapping was um, back in its time? Um, and as you answer that, I do want you all, and you're on a computer, so I understand that this is cheating a little bit or some sort of device, um, but to take a look around you and figure out how many devices are around you right now that have some sort of computer in them. And how many are going to be around you in a year or in five years as we start um, seeing the expansion of the Internet of Things and what hacking is going to mean um, for the government as they can enter more in different parts of your life and get different types of information through these operations um, that still are not governed by their own special and unique and necessary type um, of safeguards. There's another quote from Justice Brandis, Brandeis. Um, in the same opinion, um, looking through to say, you know, someday there may be developed a way by which the government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court, and by which it will be enabled to expose to a jury the most intimate occurrences of the home. He says, advances in psychic and related sciences, maybe not psychic, but. Um, may bring means of exploring unexpressed beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. Can it be that the Constitution affords no protection against such invasions of individual security? Just the idea that as technology continues to evolve, we have these thoughts that it's getting so far beyond um, even what was thought of um, back in the days of Olmsted 
and we're so far leagues ahead and we need to be putting new safeguards um, for what technology is allowing the government to do today. One final reminder, and then I'm gonna open up for um, questions that this is not happening in a vacuum. This is in fact a two front war. Um, hacking provides incentives for the government to undermine digital security. You don't necessarily want all of the holes to be patched if a hole is going to allow you to take advantage um, for an operation that you're going to be pursuing in the next week or the next month. At the same time, the FBI, DOJ, and their global partners are working diligently or out in the press all the time trying to limit the digital security that private sector um, entities, companies, et cetera, um, can implement, including what types of encryption they can put into their products. Um, and significant amount of resources, time, effort are being spent into countering the narratives that they are putting out, um, which have tried, which have significantly taken away from the resources that are necessary in order to engage in these conversations around government hacking, unfortunately, and have meant that this conversation has really suffered from a lack of attention. And between the limits on encryption and the spread of government hacking operations, I really don't know where that's going to lead us. So I was going to end with a apocalyptic scene of the future and I thought that was really dark. Um, and so I decided to end with this 1990s high school, middle school picture backdrop and ask me, ask if anybody has any questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks a lot, Amy. Um, yeah, so if, if any of you have any questions, please um, ask them in the general channel. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I guess I'll ask one that's been on my mind. So um, certainly there are many privacy engineers and security engineers and hackers who are taking all kinds of um, actions, um, some legal and some less legal, to um, you know, limit the government's ability to um, you perform hacking operations and get insight into what um, people are doing. So um, like a good recent case um, would be probably like Signal and like Moxie uh, Marlin Spikes um, hack of the cel Celebrate device that I'm sure like many people in the audience have heard of. Um, you know, Signal of course has been under fire from law enforcement for a long time. Um, and Moxie got a little bit of flack for, um, you know, Potentially, so so for so so, the, there was like one um, interesting blog post from Rihanna um, Fepperborn. I uh, might be mispronouncing her name, but um, that, that that says like along the lines of you know actions like Moxies, which are you know hacking devices used by the government, right? Um, you know, provide like ammunition essentially to lawmakers and law enforcement to kind of increase their capabilities and um, increase their leeway, and so. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have, we have um, you know, pe like people saying that you know these these actions that you know privacy engineers and security engineers are taking is kind of giving lawmakers more ammunition to um, you know pass legislation that we don't really want them to. On the other hand, it seems like lawmakers have been very happy to try and push the limits of what they're able to to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I guess I guess why I'm getting to with this very long-winded question is first of all, <laughs> um, do, do do you believe that like you know things that you know security engineers and privacy engineers are doing um, to limit like government hacking operations are um, and, and I guess this goes a little bit into what your last piece I just talked was right but um, do you, do you think they're like um, meaningfully you know causing lawmakers to increase the likelihood that they're going to pass legislation that outright bans intent encryption or you know may you know, increases the legality mm -hmm. of government hacking operations and um the second thing is you know um whether or not you believe that it's like going to meaningfully move the needle there um is that something that like privacy and security engineers have to be um concerned about in your opinion like do 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 they have to kind of limit um you know the the actions they're taking and the technologies they're developing so that they're like keeping the government sufficiently happy um you know with their capabilities without you know like kind of overstepping their boundaries so i think there are a few things there there are technologists who i've 
spoken to who very much don't want to think that policy is a thing and don't want to like engage in the legal pieces of it. Um, and they'll, they've taken the position that they can protect themselves and that's good enough. And I understand that. Like, I know how to protect my communications. I know how to, you know, secure my devices and that's great. Coming from a human rights background, I think there's an element of working to secure the broadest number of people that you can and how to make sure that many people are able to keep themselves free from unwarranted government intrusion. Um, so there's, there's two, the encryption conversation, the government hacking conversation are two very difficult, very different conversations that are happening. And that's one of the reasons I want to like, it's a two front war because you can't really engage on both sides at the same time. Because for example, encryption, we need almost a pro encryption law, um, because the FBI is going to continue to try to undermine it until we get something good on the books. And every time we, every time something happens in the news, that's like, for instance, <laughs> Celebrite is like, we can hack into Apple devices. And then Apple's like, we've stopped them from being able to do that. And Celebrite's we've gone around, like all of those back and forth that you've seen over and over and over again. Every time Apple, announces a new th way that they stop them from doing it, it gives the FBI more ammunition to go into Congress and say, we need a way to do this. Um, and until we get something positive, that's just the way it is. That doesn't mean Apple should stop doing what it's doing. I would never, ever say that. But to frame, like, you don't also go out and frame it as like, we're here to like help criminals or we're here to like make it so that you can do bad things. Um, you have to like think about your framing and all of this. On the government hacking side, we need, we absolutely need a lot. Like these operations are happening all the time. Um, and there are people, there are very hardline people who are like, no government hacking should happen at all. And I don't think that's realistic if I'm going to be totally honest. And I understand where those folks are coming from. I think getting, looking at the constitution, and realizing like when that particularity piece comes in and knowing we have to abide by the limits of the constitution, but then having the extra protections written into law is gonna be really important. Um, and there's a lot that can be done by non-government hackers to show what's possible. Um, that is really great to have those op that stuff out there within the confines of the law, do not break the law, this is not legal advice. I'm not telling anybody to go out and break the law. That's not a good thing. But going out and doing things that show the potential of what the government can be doing and publishing and, and talking about what's possible um, can really start to pull the, the curtain back on what the government could be doing for people who might not understand otherwise, like Congress. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, we have had a few questions. Um, Let's see here, I'm going to scroll through here. Um, all right, Yauza asked the question that was um, along the lines of, um, how does it work with the location-based things like GPS on devices such as phones, Fitbits, Garmin's, and cars? Certainly people would enter more than five jurisdictions. Um, so the more than five jurisdictions element is specifically to get out things like the Microsoft Exchange, where it's computers, or what was brought up during the, the debate around the rule was the botnets, um, where a botnet has bots in five or more jurisdictions. And so, so the FBI doesn't have to go to every single separate jurisdiction where a bot exists. They can go to a single jurisdiction and get a warrant for the whole thing. And it was really downplayed, which is why, why it wasn't part of the conversation. It was like, this is just a, like a 
policy, like we're just making it easier, like so they don't have to go to all of these different places. And they made it seem like a minimal change, not like they were going to start going into computers and deleting programs off of computers. This is like not something that was necessarily anticipated when the rule change was being discussed. Location was actually already anticipated by the rule. And I tried to mention this. So if your car is being tracked, like I said, and you get a warrant in one, one jurisdiction, and then in, and the tracker is installed in that jurisdiction, if anybody remembers the USV Jones case, the reason that warrant was invalid is because they installed the tracker outside of the jurisdiction where the warrant was issued and actually after the warrant was no longer valid. Um, but if you install while well, the warrant is valid in the jurisdiction and then that car drives into as many different places as possible, you don't have to go to all of those different places. Same with any location tracking. People move. All right. We have um, another question from Screen to Win. Um, considering that Rule 41 defines the location of the endpoints as the location where the crime is committed for jurisdiction purposes, does that mean that, uh, in the example you gave, if the Tor exit node is in state A and the consumer's computer is in state B, there is interstate trafficking of exploitative media? Um, yes. Start, start with that. There's a little bit more to that question after that, but so far. So it's about the difference between the, is it the difference between the Tor exit node and the computer itself? Yeah, it, it looks like the question's about, um, and, and if you want to clarify by, by the way in general, feel, feel free to do so. Um, it's about um, whether, you know, if, if a Tor exit node's in one state and, you know, like my computer is in another state, um, whether that's, um, I guess, that, that constitutes interstate trafficking of exploitative media and like whatever laws are um, kind of there surrounding, surrounding that. So, uh, go ahead, sorry. The, I mean, if you're using Tor to, to be, then you're engaging in obfuscating your location, using technical, so my, my slides are still showing, right? Yes, yes. You are concealing your location using technical means. So it, it wouldn't matter necessarily where you were versus where the different, where any of the tour nodes were, including the exit node. Um, at that point, you are concealing your location because you are sending your traffic through the tour network. Um, actually, same with any VPN, potentially. Um, so that is what this is meant to do. Rule 41 doesn't go to, to the crime itself. So child exploitation material is a absolute crime. Mens rea doesn't like, doesn't matter what your state of mind is. If you have it, it's a crime. Um, federal state, whatever it is, like, it, what this just goes to whether or not they can need where they can get a warrant to search your computer for, not necessarily if it's a crime or not. Um, like I said, this is a procedural limit, not substantive. It's not speaking to the substance of the crime. This only goes to where they can go to get the warrant for it. All right, I think we have enough time for two more questions. The first one from Urban is. Um, what current um, work is going on in Congress to like address the issues that you discussed um, in your presentation? <clears throat> um, Senator Wyden has still been very active on these issues, um, has been out in front discussing them. He actually, I don't know if anybody knows Chris Goyan, um, used to be the chief technologist at the American Civil Liberties Union. Works with Senator Wyden's office. Incredibly smart, actually testified against Rule 41 when he was at the ACLU. Um, so he leads a lot of the work that um, Senator Wyden does. Definitely pay attention to that office um, in particular. And then I know, 
what else is happening up there right now with the transition in the new Congress? I don't know if there are actively pending bills that I'm aware of. Um, but there are several different offices that get involved in this issue um, on and off. Um, and that is the Widens is really the key office, I think, to key in on, because normally he'll be if he isn't sponsoring the legislation, he's promoting it. All right. All right. Um, last question from Brandon. Um, going off the first question regarding government having and not disclosing vulnerability, can you speak at all um, to how Eternal Blue has been a prime example of this and how that um, impacted things? Uh, so there's a great, the government has a process for this. It's called the Vulnerabilities Equities Process. Um, it got re- God, what is the term, reinvigorated re under President Obama. Um, and then we didn't hear about it for a while. And every now and then you'll hear again about the vulnerabilities equities process. Um, it's supposed to take all of the different perspectives into a room and talk about when they tell you um, when they release a vulnerability and when they don't. Uh, but clearly with Eternal Blue, we've seen that not only um, are there equities at stake about when they might want to use a vulnerability versus disclose it, but if they can even guarantee that they're protecting what they're keeping. Um, one of the things that I worked very hard at for a while was this idea that the NSA, the National Security Agency, has two separate missions um, that actually under Admiral Rogers, when he was the head of the NSA, stopped being two separate missions and he just like decided to make them a mission of signals intelligence and information assurance so they're both the code breakers and people who tried to make the code better and under their information assurance mission they're responsible for consulting with NIST to the National Institute for Standards and Technologies about encryption standards and it came out under Snowden that they were basically like working to undermine encryption standards to preserve their own hacking capabilities. Um, and NIST came out with like, we're not gonna let you do that anymore and standards around it. I think we need more of those like flat out, you can't do this. These are the limits of what we're going to allow you do, to do in the name of preserving your ability to break into systems because we've seen the consequences and it's getting, <laughs> worse and worse and worse for people, um, not any better. And uh, again, with Eternal Blue and the fact that they're not protecting even their systems, like NSA used to be untouchable. Nobody thought that anybody would ever be able to break into that big dark black building in Maryland. And again and again and again, we've seen that that's not true. Um, anymore, and we need to rethink, I think, a lot of things around that. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Amy, um, and thanks, everybody, for your uh, great questions. Um, next up, we have Kurt Baumgartner talking about um, threat attribution, so I um, hope to see our next talk at uh, 3 o'clock.